thank you so much for joining us for another edition of All Angles. I'm Dion Jackson Miller. School violence once again in the news. Lots of questions, lots of suggestions as to how to deal with this seemingly intractable problem. We're going to be getting some comments, some ideas, some suggestions from guests who are going to be joining me a little later in the program. We're going to be hearing from the president of the Jamaica Teachers Association, Leighton Johnson. We'll also hear from presidents of the Jamaica Association of Guidance Counselors in Education, Roshina Anderson, as well as Director of Safety and Security in Schools at the Ministry of Education, Richard Troop. We also hope to be hearing from the president of the Jamaica Prefects Association, Kimberly Sims. Before that, though, Giovanni Dennis in 2022 did an in-depth documentary looking at this issue, and we really think it's appropriate to replay for you some parts of that documentary. Painful to watch. Painful to hear. Painful to report. It's the worst news any parent can imagine that their child is dead. But that's just the report that parents of 16 year old Kamal Hall received on Monday. Necessary, nonetheless. These students will fight in front of anybody. Our schools are becoming, slowly but surely, becoming war zones. Videos like these are once again being widely shared online. They resurfaced the moment face-to-face -face classes resumed in March. With the return of face-to-face -face classes has come an upsurge in violent behavior in our schools. Such videos aren't new. Just before the pandemic, there was a series of incidents captured on camera, fights, disrespect of teachers, and other forms of misbehavior. The ministry has promised action. In April, Education Minister Favel Williams addressed Parliament. CCTV surveillance systems to improve school safety and security. Also, we're working closely with our partners to improve safety and security within our schools. These include the Community Safety and Security Branch of the Jamaica Constabulary Force, not only to support our schools to conduct searches, but also to improve the visibility of the police in targeted spaces after school and at transport centers. And in May, Head of Safety and Security in the Education Ministry, Richard Troop, was quoted as saying CCTV was coming for six problem schools with more on the shortlist, while metal detectors were being serviced in schools. I don't fancy announcements. I want to see action. Don't tell me that you're going to put CCTV, CCTV in schools, but we are not seeing them. Don't tell me that it's going to happen. Do it, then speak to it. But telling me that we are going to and we are planning to, that really doesn't change anything. The JTA president frustrated because none of those announcements are new. These are hundreds of metal detectors Mr. Troop showed me two years ago at the onset of the pandemic. The ministry also got 30 walk-through metal detectors five years ago. At the time, much of what is being said today is what was said then. Specifically to violence, we would have invested a lot in um, handheld metal detectors. So we would have procured over 1,000 det metal detectors, handheld metal detectors, and distribute those to schools. The handheld detector, the, the walkthrough metal detector, then serves as a deterrent 
from true student actually taking these weapons to school. We also invest in CC and TV surveillance system. In the recent response, it's being almost posited as though this is a new response that can increase metal detectors and CCTV. But this has been in place and been worked on since about 2018. Right, but, but, but then um, it, you know, it's the heightened awareness that we brought back into the situation. To say to schools, yes, you have them begin to use them. Again, our students are back in the face-to-face -face environment. They're bringing things in their knapsack into school, begin to do random searches again. But for stakeholders, metal detectors won't stop the violence. When the metal detector goes off and we discover these things, are there sufficient interventive programs that are in place? Are there? Do you no, they're not. Metal detectors will never solve a problem. All it will basically do is maybe put a band-aid over an already existing problem. What we're battling is not just students engaging in fights and wanting to stab their colleagues, but there is a underlying or a, a, a oppressive matter of a degradation of the moral fiber of our youngsters in society. So we do have to look at, yes, in the short term, metal detectors, those buzz off, now we find a child with a ratchet, what do we do next? Then, if it is that the child has a serious drug issue, how is it that a 14-year-old can be admitting to smoking weed every day? Miss, I just need to mellow out before I come to school. Even outside school, frightening fist fights, muddy street walls, and scary stabbings. This happened in St. Elizabeth in June. To address the problem, we must explore the Jamaican context. The first is obvious, maybe too obvious to state, but Jamaica is violent. Researchers at Reuters News Agency found Jamaica had the highest murder rate in the world in 2021 at just under 48 murders per 100,000 people. We have the fourth highest murder rate in the world on average since the year 2000. The homicide rate for Jamaica is 48 per 100,000 since the year 2000. Now we have 17 communities in Jamaica that have murder rates higher than Iraq. There is no way in a setting like this that you're going to have stable schools. The data support this. Between 2001 and 2021, Jamaica recorded upwards of 1,000 murders per year, except for 2003 when there were 976. 2009 remains the bloodiest with 1,683 murders. There are three other years with more than 1,600 murders. As at May 2022, data from Statista ranks Jamaica as the second most dangerous country in the world by murder rate. Jamaica has been at war with itself for decades. Now, we use the word war to talk about the war against poverty, for example. If you're going to war, you have to determine who the enemy is and who is on the other side. And when you go to war, it is in order to inevitably achieve peace. Somebody has to beat somebody into submission and somebody has to say, okay, we're not fighting anymore. Let us agree to coexist in this way. Then you sign a truce and you go on to normal kind of life. No such activity has happened in Jamaica because we have not fully identified the combatants. Invariably, this impacts schools. We would have children that come from homes where there is conflict between one set of adults and another set of adults that filters to the children that comes into school. We would also have issues within the home environment that spill over into school. So we're talking about half sisters, half brothers, cousins, stepmothers, stepfathers, and children bring a lot of that into school. We also have inter-community conflict that again spill over into school. And school now becomes that petri dish where all of these competing elements are coming to bear on the behavior of the children and teachers now have that to deal with. It's sad to say the least that our parents have to fear whether or not their child or children will return home to them.
Jamal Hall is the current president of the National Secondary Students Council. The violence long predates his tenure. In fact, when we checked the archives, nearly 30 Gleena articles dating back nearly two decades demonstrate the problem isn't new. This 2006 story speaks to separate attacks on teachers. One at the Nokalva Technical High School where an 18-year-old fifth form student slashed an electrical installation teacher on his forehead during an argument. In the other incident, a 16-year-old student of the St. Thomas Technical High School was charged with unlawful wounding after he allegedly hit a teacher on the head with a piece of iron. Teen stabbed to death at school. This was in June 2007 at a primary and junior high school. His name was Janor Dinal. He was only 15. He would have been 30 years old this year. His attacker was 14 at the time, on suspension and breached the school premises when the fight happened. In 2013, no classes at Anchovy after students killing. The student was Jamelia Dawkins. She was only 13 years old, killed by another female classmate. It was reported that they had an ongoing feud. Schoolmates filmed the fight. None intervened. Jamelia would have been 23 years old today. There are many other similar reports and similar concerns from the past. But this June 17 recording of an assault at Clarendon College is more recent and painful for the victim and her parents. I had a nose bleed and my head constantly hurt me for two days straight and my neck was my neck was crooked. Those along with other bruises make up the physical pain. But then there's the psychological pain. I felt um embarrassed and when I'm going on the road, sometimes I get panic attacks and stuff like that. Painful too for her mother. When we see the video, you know what come in my head? You know, Kaylan, that little girl that have to be in a wheelchair now, that come to my brain and I say, God, I see when this going to happen to me. Her father, who lives overseas, flew home to offer support after he saw the video. I can't look at the video. Just hearing what happened was too much, still too much. I can't look at it. Two weeks, I shut off my phone in Canada, sitting there suffering. Medical expenses continue to cost the family. The mother told us the doctor who saw her daughter advised her to report it to the police, which she has done. The family is disappointed with the response of the school, Clarendon College, so far. The principal declined to comment when her correspondent reached out. You're watching a rebroadcast of a special documentary on violence in schools, Schools Under Siege by Giovanni Dennis. When we come back, some more from that documentary. And later on, my guests in studio weigh in on the issue of school violence, what we need to do about it. Stay tuned with we'll some come.